Hello YouTube, this is Your Meow Who Weeps. I am going to be going into my version of um, Yohanan or John chapter 1. Now this is um, my version of a study, um, study scriptures. Um, I'm not a translator, ling translator, linguist, anything like that. So this is just my attempt to better understand what I'm reading. Um, so you can do with this what you like. Hopefully you'll find it useful. I'm just going to go into it. Okay. Um, this is from what I understand to be called the Ketbe HaKodesh, which is Hebrew meaning, from what I understand, the separate writings. Um, I also call it Sepharim HaSepharim, which means the most excellent books, literally the books of books. But um, that means, that phrase means the most excellent books. Um, and then I also call it Sepharim Habasora Yahweh, which I'm not sure if that's linguistically accurate Hebrew, but um, I'm attempting to say in Hebrew the books of the good news of Yahweh. Um, and Yahweh is my best understanding of how to pronounce the name of the Creator. I know it's not completely known um, how that name is supposed to be pronounced. There's some variation with people's understanding, but that's my attempt. So going on. Besuras Hagula according to the Shliach Yochanan. And in English, that's um, all Hebrew, and in English my understanding is what it would mean is the beneficial and healing message of redemption. According to the emissary, Yahweh is favoring and compassionate. That's when I, what the name John or Yochanan means. Yahweh is favoring and compassionate. Okay. Um, chapter 1. I'm just going to read it. And then I will go back through with notes and, and do some um, explaining of some of the things that I thought were noteworthy. In a primacy beginning was the utterance. And in fact, the utterance was towards the Elohim. And the utterance was of an Elohim. It existed in a primacy beginning towards the Elohim. All things came to be through it. And apart from it, not one thing came to be that came to be. In it was life, and that life was the light of mankind, and the light in the darkness that shines continually, and the darkness has not overcome it. A man came to be, sent from Yahweh of Elohim, whose name was Yohanan. This one came as a witness to testify and bear witness of the light, so that everyone would firmly believe and trust through it. He was not that light, but in this way he bore witness of that light. This was the true, genuine light which enlightens everyone who comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world came to be through him, but the world didn't know or understand him. He came to those who were his own, but those who belonged to him didn't receive or join with him. But to all who did receive and join with him, those who believe and trust in his name, he's given the right and power to become sons and daughters of Yahweh of Elohim who weren't conceived out of blood, not out of the desire of the body, not out of the desire of a man, but out of Yahweh of Elohim they're conceived. And the Torah, the utterance, became flesh and dwells among and with us. And we saw his importance, the importance of the unique one close to the Father, completely filled up and full of precious beauty and healing security and truth. Yohanan testified and bore witness about him and shouts out, This was the one about whom I said, He who comes after me has become ahead of me because he was preeminent to me. From his complete fullness, we've all received lovingly kind favor upon more lovingly kind favor. Because the Torah was given through Moshe, the lovingly kind favor and the truth came to be through Yeshua HaMashiach. No one has ever seen Yahweh of Elohim. The unique El, who is in the heart of the Father, made him known. Or heart and mind of the Father, I should have said. Now this was the witness of Yohanan when the Yehudim authorities sent Kohanim and Lewi'i from Yerushalayim to ask him, Who are you? And he said the same thing. And he didn't deny, but said the same thing. I am not Hamashiach. And they asked him, Then who are you? Are you Eliyahu? So he said, I'm not. 
Are you Hanabi? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Tell us so that we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one calling out in the wilderness, make a smooth, straight path for Yahweh, as Hanabi Yeshayahu said. Now they had been sent from the Perushim, and they asked him, Then why do you immerse if you are not Hamashiach, or Eliyahu, or Hanabi? Yohanan answered, I immerse with water, but among you stands one that you don't know or even perceive. The one coming after me has become preeminent to me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to even loosen. This came to be in Beit Anya, beyond the Yardain, where Yohanan was immersing. On the next day, Yohanan saw Yoshua coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of Yahweh of Elohim, who takes away the error, wrong, and lostness of the world. This is the one about whom I said, After me comes a man who has become ahead of me, because he was preeminent to me. And I didn't know or even perceive him, but I came immersing in water so that he would be revealed to Yisrael. Then Yohanan bore witness and testified, I saw the Ruach coming down from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And I didn't know or even perceive that it was him. But the one who sent me to immerse with water said to me, The one on whom you see the Ruach coming down and remaining on him, this is he who immerses with Ruach HaKodesh. And I have both seen and I have witnessed and testified that this man is the Son, the Chosen One of Elohim. Again on that following day, Yohanan was standing there with two of his Talmudim, and gazing at Yoshua as he walked by, he said, Look! the Lamb of Yahweh of Elohim. When the two Talmudim heard him say this, they followed Yoshua. Yoshua turned around and saw them following and said to them, What do you want? And they said to him, Rebbe, where are you staying? He answered them, Come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. Amatya, the brother of Shimon Eben, was one of the two who heard what Yohanan said and followed him. First he found his own brother Shimon and said to him, We found Hamashiach! And he brought him to Yoshua. Yoshua looked at him and said, You are Shimon, the son of Yohanan. You will be called Aben. On the next day, Yoshua wanted to go to the Galilee, and he found Peresh and said to him, Follow me. Now Paresh was from Beit Saida, the original town of Amatya and Aben. Paresh found Netanel and said to him, We found the one whom Moshe wrote about in the Torah, and then Nebaim also wrote about, Yoshua of Nazareth, the son of Yosef. And Netanel replied, Is it possible for anything good to come out of Nazareth? Paresh said to him, Come and see. Yoshua saw Netanel coming toward him and exclaimed, Look, a true Yisraelite in whom there is no deceit. Netanel said to him, How do you know me? Yoshua answered him, Before Parash called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Netanel answered and said to him, Rebbe, you are the son of Elohim, you are the king of Israel." Yoshua said to him, because I told you I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than that. And he said to him, This is the truth, this is absolutely true. I'm telling you, you will see the heavens open and the messengers of Elohim ascending and descending upon the son of Adam. And I just wanted to quickly say when it said, um, Because I told you I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Um, I believe that, that believe is actually, believe, believe, believe. I'm, um, I think that's actually to, um, to firmly and securely trust. Um, okay, going on with my notes. Excuse me. Um, the first note I have is for um, when it says in a primacy beginning, that's from the Hebrew Bereshit. Um, the Greek is ar arche or arche, and it means in, a be in the beginning. Um, but that is a reference, a direct reference to Bereshit or Genesis chapter 1-1. Um, 
and then when I said the utterance, um, that's from the Greek word logos, and the Hebrew equivalent would be dabar, and dabar means word or order, order and I'm going to go back um, and read my note on that. So, the Greek translation is logos, and means motive, reasoning, intent, thought, word, expression, or plan. And it's probably from the Hebrew dabar. This word denotes a unit that was made to come about. It can be a single word, but can also be a whole sentence or statement like the Ten Words, Akka the Ten Orders or Ten Commandments. Debar can be an act, such as the acts of King David from 1 Chronicles 29.29, 29, or Debre Hayamim, the things that David made to come about. And it can be a whole literary corpus, a book as a physical object or a general, general account, is called Debar Seper. Um, such as the book of Shemuel the seer who recorded the acts of David or Dibre Hayamim and that Dibre is the plural of Dabar um, which is translated events of the days or times probably possibly um, and I have a note saying that that um, that word is, is pro either possibly or probably the et the Aleph Tau um, and I have notes uh, saying see Bereshit 1-1 one, one, and 1-3. One, um, sorry, I've got an itch. Driving me crazy. The word dabar is commonly found in the biblical text meaning speak, as in the phrase vaya dabar Yahweh el Moshe lamor, which means in English, and Yahweh spoke to Moses saying. The ancient Hebrew understanding of speaking or a speech is an ordered arrangement of words. The word dabar may better be translated as order, as in the phrase, and Yahweh gave orders to Moshe, saying. These orders are an order, ordered arrangement of ideas. Logos and dabar are both masculine nouns. Um, let's see, what was my next note? Um, Man, I've got itch, itch, itch. Sorry. Um, when it says it was um, towards the Elohim and the utterance was of Elohim, and I think that utterance may very well be the Torah, but um, when it says, when I say of an Elohim, that this is the note that I have for that. Um, the construct does not suggest identity, that the utterance of Elohim was the person of Elohim, but rather quality, that the utterance of Elohim was Elohim utterance, that the utterance came from Elohim. It is the same idea as when Shaul, or Paul, said that all writings are Elohim breathed. The ancient Greeks used the word theos, both in the singular and the plural, similar to the Hebrew usage of Elohim, because the Elohim um, in Hebrew can mean plural of quantity or per plural of quality. So it's either more than one or it's really, really awesome one. Greek scholar Jason Bedoun from the Northern Arizona University says this. The Greek phrase is theos and hologos, which translated word for word is a god was the word. Greek has only a definite article like our the. It does not have an indefinite article, like our a or an. If a noun is definite, it has the definite article ho. If a noun is indefinite, no article is used. In the phrase from John 1.1, 1, 1, ho logos is the word. If it was written simply logos without the definite article ho, we would have to translate it as a word. So we are not really inserting an indefinite article when we translate Greek nouns without the definite article into English. We are simply obeying rules of English grammar that tell us that we cannot say Snoopy is dog, but must say Snoopy is a dog. Going on. Um, man, just itch, itch, itch. Sorry. <laughs> you don't, probably don't need to know that. Um, when I say it existed in a primacy beginning, this is my uh, note on it. Um, 
It may refer to it or he or she, depending on the context. And th so throughout the Brit Hadashah, the, the New Covenant, or new, what people call New Testament, is speaking of a word, or logos, so if it's speaking about a logos or a debar, the pronoun would correctly be rendered it, because it's not speaking about a person there, it's speaking about a concept, or, or you know, a word. When we say a word, um, if you say, I have so many words in my sentence, the words that are in your sentence don't actually have gender. So that's why I translated it as it. Um, going on, uh, when it says life, my footnote on life is the word translated as life is used 36 times in this good news. Also, other concepts which occur prominently in Bereshit, um, chapter 1, are also found, and that's Genesis chapter 1, are also found in Yohanan's prologue, Life, Light, and Darkness. Um, let me see, I have another note. Lots of notes on this one. Um, when it says the light and the darkness, um, the word translated, oh no, I don't have a, a footnote for that. I was going to, but I don't. Sorry. Um, let's see. Um, um. Oh, when it says, um, this one came as a witness to testify and bear witness of the light so that everyone would firmly believe and trust through it, um, that it could be him. So it's either saying, um, so that everyone would firmly believe and trust through that light, or so that everyone would firmly believe and trust through Yohanan, or so that everyone would firmly believe and trust in the light, which is Yahweh, um, or which you could say was Yeshua. But I think there's, there's a little bit of um, different ways of looking at that. Anyways, going on. Um... Oh, I have a note saying the word translated as world, so it's the cosmos, the in, um, which in, in some contexts I think refers to the entirety of humanity. In some contexts it's referring to um, like the universe. In some contexts it's referring to our world, the earth, and, and what's on the earth, the, all of human activity and everything else that goes on on the earth with the animals and everything. Um, but, but the cosmos, it's used 78 times in this good news, in the good news of Yohanan. Um, and then when I, um, if you noticed before when um, sometimes I was saying it, and sometimes I said he, like um, I, when I was talking about the light, I was referring to it as it. But when I was talking about um, he was in the world and the world came to be through him, my footnote on that says... Um, it is debatable which pronouns should be translated it and which should be translated he. I personally think that the name and related pronouns here are referring to the light, to Yahweh. So that is my note on that. Um, uh, my next footnote. Okay, um, uh, sorry, looking, looking. Um, and when it says, um, and the Torah, the utterance became, that it could be became or is flesh, um, or generated flesh. Um, and that flesh, would, uh, the Hebrew would be bazaar, meaning good news, but it's, um, the concept of bazaar is, is meat or flesh, but when somebody brought good news, they would celebrate by having some meat, which was a rare thing. They didn't always do it. So, um, bazaar came to be known as good news, so I thought it was very interesting that um, the utterance, when the utterance became flesh, you could also be saying the utterance became good news. Fascinating to me. And dwells or dwelt, so I'm not sure whether um, it would actually be in the present tense or in the past tense. And it says in a mishkan, um, which we would understand to be tabernacle, um, but I think it's, it's basically a temporary dwelling, if I remember. I might research it and, and post an annotation, but um, that's what I remember. 
Um, I have a note saying the Greek word used is the same term used for the tabernacle. So the same term that they used for the, the Septuagint, I think it is, the Greek translation of the Tanakh, what people call the Old Testament, is the same word that's used there for the tabernacle, um, for the Mishkan. Um, oh, here, um, 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 going back, sorry. Uh, itching like crazy. Oh, and when it says, and we saw his importance, the Greek word there is doxa and means honor, and the Hebrew um, equivalent would be kabod and means weight. And my note on that says, um, the weight is honor or weightiness, like importance. Like if you say, oh, that person holds a lot of weight, you're not necessarily saying that they're a weightlifter or that they're really heavy. You're saying that they have a lot of importance and, and honor. They're held in high regard. And it can be referring to like reputation or opinion or wonderfulness or high, high regard. Um, and I have here that um, when it says, um, oh, where is that? Um, completely filled up and full of precious beauty and healing security. Um, the Hebrew that would be used there, um, I, I, the Greek is, I can't remember, it's translated in English as grace, but the, the Hebrew would be chain and would be translated as um, well, here's the note I have on it. Inherent in the idea of chain is a wall that separate that creates a separation between the harshness and danger outside the wall and the peace, comfort, and security inside. So, um, so that's why I put full of precious beauty and healing security. Because that's that's the idea of chain is is that it's separating you from from the danger and harshness and and destructiveness of the world outside, with the warmth and and the beauty and, and comfort and healing um, and security that you find inside inside the wall. So going on, um, and that. Um, when it says, um, this is the one about whom I said, he, comes, he who comes after me has become ahead of me, that ahead of is emprostain, and uh, means to, like, if you're, I, I believe that it means, like, if you're following someone, that person that's ahead of you is ahead of you. That's the concept. Um, and then the protos, um, because he was preeminent to me, is preeminent as protos, and means um, in a higher position. And the Hebrew con oh, term equivalent would be Rishon, I believe. Um, then when it says, um, because the Torah was given through Moshe, because this happened, the Torah being given through Moshe, then this happened, the lovingly kind favor and truth came to be through Yeshua HaMashiach. And my note on that says, oh, I'll put a, an annotation. Um, one O. Where, 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 where? Itch, itch, itch. Oh, when it says the unique Ale who is in the heart of the Father, it could be saying the unique Son. So I'm not sure which one it is. Um, when I have, um, 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 let's see, let's see. Oh, the Yehudim, that's from Yehuda, commonly known as Judah, but it means to look at and be awed by and intimately know Yahweh. That's what the name Yehuda means. So the Yehudim is just the plural of the, the, the descendants of Yehuda, um, the descendants of his, um, of his tribe. The word Yehudim, plural of Yehuda, is used 70 times in this good news. So it's used quite a bit. Um, see. Oh, with the Messiah? This is my footnote on Messiah. Um, no uniform Jewish expectation of a single end times figure existed in the first century. A majority expected the Messiah, 
but some extra-biblical books describe Elohim's intervention without mentioning the anointed king relating to Dawid. In parts of First Enoch, for example, the figure of the Son of Man, not the Messiah, embodies the expectations of the author. Essenes at Qumran seem to have expected three figures, a prophet, a priestly messiah, and a royal messiah. In immersing, Yohanan the Immerser is possibly, was possibly performing an end times action. It also seems to have been part of his proclamation. See Yohanan or John 1, 23 and uh, 26 through 27. Crowds were beginning to follow him. He was operating in an area not too far from the Essene center on the Dead Sea. No wonder the authorities were curious about who he was. Um, when they're asking if he's Eliyahu, um, my notes here says possibly, according to some Jewish belief, Eliyahu didn't die and will return to earth to herald the coming of the Messiah. Um, and when they're asking is if he's the Navi, that's uh, com in English commonly um, called prophet, but it basically just means spokesman. The Nabi refers to the prophet that Moshe said Yahweh would send, who Yisrael must obey. Um, oh, and then taking off the sandals, it says that it's a task only a menial slave would do. So a menial uh, servant, it's it's basically a voluntary slave. It's, it's not, um, from my understanding, it's not a slave in, in the concept that we understand slave, but it's more like an employee. It's like um, like the janitor, or like you know, some employee that you think is just really low on the totem pole kind of thing. Um, going on. Um, that uh, Beit Anya means house of affliction or misery, or poor house, or the house of Yah, Yah is compassionate, or house of Yah has intervened, and it's possibly the house of figs. So that's what Beit Anya means. Um, one Y. Let me go back. Oh, when it says the error, wrong, and lostness of the world, uh, my note on that says. Um, that it means having gone astray or missed the way, bewildered as to place, direction, etc., like lost children. That's basically what it's talking about. Um, like if children are, get lost and they have no idea where they are. That's the concept behind what's, what's being talked about right there. Um, let's see. And the Talmudim, that's the Hebrew word that basically means students, or learners, or taught ones, or disciples. And um, I've heard a teaching that makes a really good case that the Talmudim, Yeshua's Talmudim, were basically teenagers. And the oldest one was Aben, Peter, and he was about 20. But the rest of them were in their teens. Um, and Yeshua, I've heard that he was the age anywhere from like 28 to 33. And that was a common occurrence, from my understanding, is the, the Rebbe, the teacher, and Rebbe means um, great one. I'm planning on having an annotation on this, but um, Rebbe means um, great one and referred to a teacher. And so the teacher would have his students, his Talmudim, and they would a lot of times be um, boys who would be learning the Torah. And they would, I mean, they would like memorize the Torah and be able to go back and forth in conversation. I've heard how they would be able to like... Um, recite a line from the Torah, and then the other student would be able to recite a corresponding line from a different part of the Torah, so that they would be able to have a conversation in concepts with using lines only from the Torah. They wouldn't use any other words, just lines from the Torah, which is, to me is just phenomenal. But um, going on, oh, Amatsya? would be otherwise known as Andrew. I, I thought that his name was probably Amatsya since it was um, Hebrew-speaking culture back then, and at least that's why I understand. I know there's you know, some debate over whether it was Hebrew or Aramaic-speaking. It could have been both. They were very likely were multilingual, but maybe not. I, you know, I, don't, I haven't researched that well enough to say for sure. But, um, but yeah, Andrew in Hebrew would be Amatsya. 
And um, Aben, my understanding, um, Aben means rock in Hebrew, and it would be Kepha in Galilean Aramaic, it would be Petros in Greek, and it would be Peter in English, or Pieter in Russian, or Pierre in French. Um, I have a note saying the Talmudim's understanding of who um, and what Hamashiach was possibly changed a lot from the different views held by their culture at the time to who he was revealed to be. Um, then my note on Petros, because Petros is the Greek um, word for Aben, that's used for Aben or Kepha if you think that it was Aramaic, um, but Petros denotes a wobbly flint that won't supply any footing and can be tossed away at will. So Petros, basically, it's like saying that he's unstable, unreliable, and disposable. Um, another note I have is no explanation is given for why Yoshua wanted to set out for the Galilee, but probably he wanted to go to the wedding at Cana, which was about a two-day trip. Um, and that, uh, let's see, JJ, sorry. Um, oh, Peresh um, was the Hebrew equivalent of the name uh, Philip. Um, and going on, um, uh, just a moment. Oh, the son of Yosef was a title for the Mashiach. There were two Mashiachs in Hebrew understanding from what I've learned. There were two Mashiachs. There was um, the son of Dawid, uh, the kingly Mashiach, and the son of Yosef would, would have been the suffering Mashiach. Um, so they're saying that Yoshua, who is actually literally the son of Yosef, but he's also... Um, basically saying that he's the Mashiach son of Yosef. So whether they were intending that or not, I'm not sure, but that's what the title itself refers to. Um, and then I have, many have speculated about what Netanel, commonly known as Nathaniel, was doing under the fig tree, praying for and meditating on the Messiah who was to come a good possibility since the fig tree was used as shade for teaching or studying by the later rabbis. Also, the fig tree was symbolic for messianic peace and plenty. Um, that is all the notes I have for Yohanan 1.1. I will have annotations up with this, but um, if you have any insight into this, like I said, to me this is uh, an in-depth Bible study is basically what it is to me. In-depth in -depth scripture study. That's what I use this for, to try and better understand what I'm reading. Um, but if you have any insight into anything that I've got on here, please share it. I'd be very interested in learning. Um, I hope this has been beneficial, and I hope it's not too long. Um, anyways, Yahweh bless you. Have a very good day life, all of it. Thank you for watching, and shalom. Au revoir.